going to talk about that. So welcome, Charlene, all the way from Tennessee, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, your children. Okay. I'm the uh, happy wife of Ray Notgrass, who lots of people love his writing of high school history. And uh, we've been married for 45 years. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. We have three fabulous children and uh, eight grandchildren. So we're a, a big family now. And at Christmas, we got a table big enough that we can all sit at the same table. <laughs> That's <laughs> wonderful. We can all sit around the same table. <laughs> We're all quarantined and there's nobody at our table. And nobody, a big table with nobody there. Wow. Uh, yeah, but that's okay. Um, so tell us a little bit about your homeschool journey. All righty. Well, we started in 1990. And I'd love to tell you that it went just fantastic. Uh, it went fantastic. But after two years, I was absolutely worn out, yeah. crying, exhausted. And we quit for two years. And when we came back, we made homeschooling who we were instead of what we did. And it made all the difference. And when our journey was almost over, we couldn't stand the thought of not keeping on. And we started Not Grace History. And now we are, get to be with homeschoolers all the time. All of our employees are either homeschoolers or homeschool graduates and or homeschooled parents. So um, it's been quite a journey. But I, I like I used to say all the time, we made all the mistakes so you don't have to. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but anyway, if I had it to do over again, our children would never spend a day in anything besides homeschooling. I regret that we did not know that from the beginning. We were in the pioneer days. And when we started homeschooling, I knew one other family who was homeschooling at the yeah. time. And um, so, but we're grateful. And for people who are suddenly homeschooling, accidentally homeschooling because of the Cypher at Home measures, we know what that's like because we decided to homeschool in August. Uh, so we know what it's like to scramble. And uh, the first time it was August when we decided to do it. I like to say being such organized people and always planning things way in advance, we started in August. <laughs> wow. So, so it's doable. It's doable. It is doable. Yes. It is definitely. Well, I, I want to say on behalf mm -hmm. of us, um, the, the generation that's just now homeschooling, thank you to the pioneers. And what you guys paved the way for us is is beyond a blessing. And God used you and your generation so that we have the freedoms that we have now and the resources and the wisdom from your generation to gain from. I, I do not know how you guys did it. Well, by the grace of God and with God's leadership. Um, but we are so blessed to have you and your generation to come alongside of us and encourage us and and sometimes just make us feel like, you know what? we're not blowing it because you too had took two years off and realized, you know, so your struggles God has used for good. And so I'm so excited to have you here to impart that wisdom, to encourage us, to tell us to keep going. And I wrote down, I'm going to repeat in case anyone missed it. Homeschooling is, is who we are, not what we did. And I think that's probably a, a a key that we need to all take away from this. It really changed everything for us. And we enjoyed those first two years and we have wonderful memories. But after that two year break, which was one year in a Christian school and one year in public school, when we came back, we just learned how to relax mm -hmm. and to uh, take the opportunities that God gave us every day. We did it very purposefully. But we also did it in a very relaxed way. You can do both of those at the same time very successfully. And our children are very grateful that we homeschooled them. And we are grateful to watch a new generation of homeschoolers and our grandchildren. And so um, I just so believe in this. I'm, and I'm, I'm so grateful. I have a talk I do about how Teddy Roosevelt's parents homeschooled him. 
Love to share that with you all sometimes. It is oh, a God. wonderful story. I wish I could meet his mom and daddy. They oh. were brilliant homeschoolers. And this was during the Civil War. That's how long ago they were homeschooling. And they purposely made a decision to homeschool because they were afraid that public school would coarsen their children. That was the word they used. This is in the 1860s. That's incredible. Yes, they're pioneers, but we stood on the shoulders of people who had done it since God first created people. Wow. Homeschooling has happened. Yes, because I believe that that's how God designed designed it when he made us parents is to teach and train up our children in his ways. Wow. So we're, we'll have you back to talk about Teddy Roosevelt. But today I I'm so excited about um, this topic. I, and I'll just announce it. It's called Winston Churchill from struggling learner to world leader. And that is powerful because sometimes when we have struggling learners, or even, even if we don't have a struggling learner, if we see our kids struggling through something, I was just telling Charlene before we got on today, we're starting long division with my son. And I, I braced myself. I'm like, here we go. Here we go. I've done this before and, and get ready. So I know it's just an encouragement that whether you have a struggling learner or just a, a, t- a period of time where your student is struggling, this will be a great encouragement. So will you tell us a little bit, Charlene, um, about Winston Churchill and who he was in his childhood? I, I would love to. Thank you. He was born in a palace, literally in a palace, the only private home in England that was called a palace because his ancestor had been a war hero and uh, this palace was a gift to him. And his parents happened to be visiting there that weekend. It was his grandparents' home, I believe, at that time. And he was that's where he was born. And he was born into that lifestyle, too. And so his mom did what moms did then. The first thing she had to do was hire a wet nurse. And then later she hired a governess for him. And he did not grow up with the ideal parents. He did not grow up with the kind of parents that your children are growing up with, all of you homeschooling Idaho moms, who I believe are heroines every day. That's not what Winston Churchill had. His parents were socialites. They were always all over the place. When he learned to read and write, he started writing letters to his parents for always on one trip or another. And they never wrote him back near as many times as he wrote to him. It is a heartbreaking childhood. But he had this governess who adored him and who he adored. And she taught him to read with this book called Reading Without Tears. And you're like, isn't that great? Because he was born, let me see, uh, in 1874. So when he was just a little kid, there was this book called Reading Without, Reading Without Tears. Yeah, isn't that great? But that. Uh, when Abby told me about her fear about this long division, I read to her what Winston Churchill said about math. He said it was not any use being nearly right. In some cases, these figures got into debt with one another. You had to borrow one or carry one, and afterwards you had to pay back the one you borrowed. <laughs> Math and Churchill were never friends, ever. Mm. And, and But what is absolutely wonderful is that when World War II was raging in Europe, Winston Churchill was elected prime minister of England. And you and I are standing here free today, partially because Winston Churchill was prime minister of England. I'm telling you, we don't, we owe so much to this man. Hitler was taking over one country after another, after another, and many of them were capitulating to him. They were just saying, oh, I give up. And the prime minister before Winston Churchill was exactly like them. He just kept appeasing and appeasing and appeasing Hitler. But Hitler had been prime minister for less than one month when Hitler was at the edge of the English Channel getting ready to come over and conquer England. And Winston Churchill led his country through, we're never giving up. We are never giving up. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if they come. 
And they did bomb them heavily during World War II. My husband's mother was a British girl living in one of those cities that Hitler bombed when his when my husband's father was an American soldier who came over to uh, her grandfather. When my um, father-in-law used to come and visit this girl he liked that he met at church while he was an American soldier and she was this British girl, <laughs> 12 years his junior. And uh, she was 16 and he was 28. And But anyway, when he would come over to visit, her grandfather would say, is this our brave defender? Uh, but uh, another thing that Churchill did was to become friends with uh, Franklin Roosevelt mm -hmm. and bring Americans to come and help them. So mm -hmm. I, I won't go on and on about the history of it because I need to tell you about Winston Churchill as a little boy. So his parents did what parents in his social class did. They sent him to boarding school and it was horrible. He never fit at boarding school. And finally, after two years, when he ran away with his backside in his back, beaten by, because that was their way of discipline, mm -hmm. he came home and his mother, who had never come to visit him at boarding school in the two years he was there, decided to send him someplace else. And she sent him to another school that let him learn things that he cared about, not just what educators said was important. Winston Churchill loved literature. He loved language. He loved French. He loved history. He didn't necessarily get so long, along so well with Greek and Latin and math and some of those other things that people thought was important. So in those two years, he went from being a troublesome, irritating child at school to one who began to learn to uh, learn to love learning, which he had already loved when he was a little boy in the nursery with his beloved governess. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so for two years, he got a little bit of a respite, but then they sent him to another boarding school and it all started again. Mm -hmm. That one wasn't beating him, but they were very, very hard on him. And it was so hard for him to even get in. And he said this absolutely mm -hmm. wonderful thing about taking tests. I don't know if any of your kids have trouble with taking tests. But I would imagine that some of them do. And he said, examinations were a great trial to me. The subjects which were dearest to the examiners were almost invariably those I fancied least. I should have liked to be asked to say what I knew. They always tried to ask what I did not know. I mean, don't you know there are children who were in public school two months ago when they could be in public school who feel that way? They Absolutely. don't ask me what I don't know. They don't ask me what I know. And yep. one of the blessings of homeschooling is that you can find out what makes your children's heart sore. Yes. And you can emphasize that. Uh, one of our children struggled learning to read. And then when she learned how to read, which was much later than the other two had learned how to read, she didn't like it. And I I mean, she she was in a family of, of people who loved to read, but she, mm -hmm. she was not one who did. And I remember so distinctly the day I went to the public library and I was standing there in the stacks and I was just thinking, what can I get her to read? And my eyes fell on Winnie the Pooh uh -huh. and the original with the E.H. Shepherd illustrations. And I picked that up and I brought it home and she devoured it. And then the next one and the next one and the next one. And she has loved to read ever since. But in her case, it took just that. Right. That 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 first one. And I this is how I describe this youngest child of ours. I am so grateful that she was able to live in the comfortable cocoon of homeschooling 
until she was ready to emerge as a butterfly. And once she emerged, she has never stopped soaring. She's the homeschool mother of four now. She's a writer for Not Gross History. And when she was 15, she came to me one day and she said, this was after we became homeschoolers. She came to me one day and she said, Mom, I'd like to write a play and ask homeschoolers to be in it. And I said, okay, that'll be English right now. And she wrote it. That was 21 years ago. She has written and directed and choreographed and written the music and uh, produced a play every year since. Wow. If the coronavirus quarantine is over, this fall will be play number 22, where I've had the privilege of being her assistant director. And now she'll have every year, there are a hundred children from a broad area whose parents drive them in for practice. And we do, and everyone has been a faith filled, history based uh, play. Think wow. kids through the years, they've been behind the Iron Curtain in Russia. They've lit, they've been part of the French resistance in World War II. They've been with Gladys Elward in China. They've been at the first deaf school in America. They have suffered through the polio epidemic of the 1950s through these plays. And this child, Ray and I are looking at each other saying, how oh, can we teach her to read? And that then we found this PBS program called Letter People. It is so, so elementary and would look, you know, just so low tech, you know. Right. But that was the key for her. And and so this Winnie the Pooh and the Letter People, what's the point of that? The point is, as homeschooling mothers, you can find out yes. what that is. Yes. And uh, poor Churchill's uh, difficulty was that he did not have parents who were right there with him. But when he was at that last school, there were two professors who took a great interest in him. And one of them was his fencing coach. And his fencing coach would have him over to talk about history. And his English teacher just the teachers there were flabbergasted at this boy because in things he loved, he soared. In things he didn't, it was terrible. He finally, when he finally graduated, oh, I want to say this. One thing you have the opportunity with in homeschooling is not to, um, oh, what's the word? Humiliate your child. Mm -hmm. At the third school that he went to that he finally graduated from they ranked the kids in their class and so one day mm -hmm. this man who became prime minister of great britain who in many who god used as an instrument literally to save the world okay i'm not speaking too <laughs> uh, too strongly here he helped to save the world uh, the first time, they, I don't know, I think it was the first time that parents came. I don't think his parents came because each of his parents missed him, visited him one time in the like four years he was there. But one time his dad came to the town where he, his son was in school and didn't go see him. But any, I'm so thankful your children are not growing up with those kind of parents. And he idolized them, adored them. Of course he did. With everything he could to make them love him. His dad never approved of him his whole life. Mm -hmm. His mother finally, she loved him. But as Churchill said, I adored her. She seemed like a fairy princess to me, but at a distance. Aww. Doesn't that just break your heart? But anyway, one time at this school, it was parents day to come and they paraded the children in by class with the best student as number mm -hmm. one and the worst student as number whatever, the last. And Churchill walked in as the last kid. And uh, which makes him even more amazing. 
Oh, you know, ab absolutely. I, I, it's, it's absolutely incredible. I'm such a fan of his, you know, he was not perfect. He was faithful to his wife, which is something neither of his parents yeah. were by a long shot. Yeah. But uh, he, um, you know, he wasn't perfect. But considering what he came from and what absolutely. he did, I am just... I'm just wow. <laughs> it's, it's so yeah. interesting. We um, just this week, my, my kids and I are doing World War II right now. And just this week we were reading about him. And then as we're talking, never in a million years would I have realized what he had been. I mean, I just assumed this is a brilliant man. This is a guy that's been smart his whole life. This is a guy that's always. And, and I want to encourage parents watching this. Many of your children feel like those those world leaders, those world changers, you know, oh, they've always been smart and I'm not smart. I'm struggling because many of you who just have your kids home, they take these tests in school. They get an F because they're being tested on something that's not their passion. And then they have that label in their own head that says, I could never be a Winston Churchill because I struggle with this. And so let your children hear the story. It is so important to teach your children history so they can hear the story of it doesn't matter what you're struggling with because you might not fit in the box, but God has a plan for you. And I think of your daughter with these plays, you know, it, it all started. And with every child, including Winston Churchill, every child is born with a passion and a desire to learn. They just are. We want to learn. That's why kids go outside and they pick up rocks and they poke at bugs and they, they want to learn. And somewhere along the way, we train that out of them by, by telling them what it is they have to learn, how they have to learn it, where they have to learn it, when they have to learn it. And I think of your daughter, if she came to you and said, I want to do this play. And, and you would have said, well, I'm sorry, that doesn't fit in the grammar book. You know, you have 14 worksheets instead. I know. That passion would have, would have been taken out of her and she would never see what God has done to use her. And we have that blessing as parents to to spend the time, first of all, you spent the time. It probably took you a while to find those Winnie the Pooh books. To you know, it wasn't probably the first book you grabbed. But we have the time, we have the ability, and what we have is like that governess. We have a love for our children that nobody else in the whole wide world is ever going to have. And it, it it doesn't matter what our education background is. It is our desire to see our children succeed, to find their passions and their goals and their dreams. And then to cash in on those, that's what's going to make our children successful, just like Winston Churchill. Absolutely. And he, and they don't have to be Winston Churchill. Your right. child might be a hero in her own home as a Absolutely. homeschooling mother. Uh, I, I, I've thought so much about the little boy in second grade who um, would be the best auto mechanic in his community 20 years from now but he's got to sit in a classroom where he doesn't learn the way the other kids do and he's going to have to do that year after year after year after year and then when he gets out maybe he becomes a methamphetamine addict or something <laughs> i mean seriously because he never was encouraged to right. use what God gave him. And, you know, I there are occupations that we hold up on a pedestal and there are other occupations that we put down. Like mm -hmm. right now, aren't we grateful <laughs> for every farmer yep. and warehouse Amen. worker and truck driver and, and grocer and grocer and men. Yeah, and meat house packing employee and Absolutely. on and on and on. Seriously. Yep. So um they're we like to call those people essential. <laughs> they are very essential because God made them in his image and he had a plan for them for such a time as this. Exactly. And every person, every person has value. And when we start putting letter grades on kids and we start building boxes to fit them in, and when a kid doesn't fit in it a certain way, we tell them they don't have the value of the next kid. Or like in Winston Churchill's kid, it, a case, we line them up in order of, of what we deem as what is successful. Mm -hmm. that, that is not how God intended it. And moms and dads, we have an incredible opportunity right now. Those parents that have brought their kids home, well, had their children brought home in the last two months, you have just been given and your children have just been given the greatest gift you could possibly imagine. You have an opportunity to know who your kids are, learn who they are, what makes them tick, what makes them 
passionate and excited and you get to get behind them and, and watch them soar. Like you said, I got a, a series of funny cartoons. Um, my aunt has sent me a couple recently. And the last one was specifically about what we're going through right now. And one of them um, was a complainy thing about my kids being home. <laughs> and, and uh, oh, that, that kind of thing. I'm not criticizing her, of course. Right. Uh, right. It was just one of a whole series of really funny ones right. that happened to be in there. Uh, but anyway, you're absolutely right, Abby. You've been given this precious gift. And I want to say something about you. Your children have been given a precious gift too. They were given you. And when God created your children, he knew he loves them more than you can ever possibly love them. And you know how much you love them. Mm -hmm. But God loves them way more than that. And yet, out of all the people in the history of the world, he picked you to be your child's parent. Right. So right. one of the reasons that people struggle with the education of their children is because of their own feelings mm -hmm. of being inadequate. Right. But or they've God, been told. They've right. been told by a system that said, you aren't, you yeah. know, you don't have the credentials to teach your child. And I said, you know what? The day God put that child in your womb or gave you that child at whatever state, the day that you became that child's mom, he promised you that he would equip you. And you're the best possible person to teach that child. I don't care what degree you do or don't have. You are the best possible teacher for the child God gave you. I 100% I agree. And uh, every child is made in the image of God. So you have amazing material to work with. When you yeah, that's, true. that's true. Yeah. You're right. That's a great point. <laughs> God, you can't get any better than that, right? Yeah. So, uh, and and none of them are mistakes, right? And uh, so, um, who knows? You know what God has in mind for your child uh, for such a time as this, and they're going to be right. such a times as this again and again, and you know, like we have now. Not, I'm not, that's not a doom and gloom statement. That's just a, every person either personally or, mm -hmm. I mean, this is the first crisis I have ever been in in my life that literally involved the whole world. I mean, I've been in lots of other crisis, crises right. in my life. And the, uh, Abby wanted me to talk about why it was important to study history. And I want right. to say uh, before we finish that, History gives hope. That's one of the reasons to study history. History gives hope because back to Winston Churchill, mm -hmm. just days, I think it was 16 days after he became prime minister, that all these British troops were surrounded by Hitler. They had the English Channel on one side and, and they were completely surrounded and they wondered they were so afraid they could not rescue those troops. And it was going to be a huge loss for their whole military if they lost this bunch of troops right there on the coast. And uh, if any of you've ever heard of Dunkirk, there was um, this amazing rescue. Several European countries, navies coordinated, merchant marine ships coordinated, and English People who owned a boat got in those boats and sailed, went across the English Channel, and they just kept this going and going and going. And it was, it seemed impossible. It just looked like their back was against the wall, just like it looks to a lot of us now. Right now. Mm -hmm. but, but when you know that people have been through terrible things mm -hmm. before, my father-in-law survived the flu epidemic of 1918. He and his dad got it. My husband would not be here today. My children would not be here today if his dad had not survived the flu epidemic wow. of 1918. And, uh, and if he hadn't, his dad wouldn't have been one of those American soldiers who landed in Great Britain and who went to, you know, who uh, 
what landed in France 30 days after D-Day and on and on and on, you know? Um, so history gives hope. Absolutely. People have been through horrible things before. When the American Revolution started, they had no guarantees that it right. would turn out the way it did. Right. So signers of the Declaration of Independence pledged their life and their sacred honor. That mm -hmm. was not, those were not idle words. Right. They knew that, I mean, they were traitors. And, right. uh, but they amazingly, 13 little colonies on the East Coast of North America, the, the most powerful country in the world. Great Britain at that time. And then who would have thought century and a half later that we would be on our on the same side fighting Hitler? Right, right. So every My kids thought that was so interesting. It's so fun to do history with them. And they're like, that just kind of flip-flopped. And it's so important for them to see that. And what I when you say history gives hope, what I notice is as we're doing American history right now with our kids. It's taking some of the fear away of what we're going through right now because they have not seen this. Everything's been perfect forever. And this is the first time we've ever done anything. And and they have examples of people. And I, I might I almost thought I might not say that I might botch this, but um, we'll post it in the comments. There's a quote by, I believe, Billy Graham. And, and you might know this, um, Charlene, but he said something when one, one man stands, it strengthens the backbones of all the other men. And I, I love that quote because when we read history, we see men like Winston Churchill and it does strengthen all of us to be able to stand or overcome or, or whatever is, it is that we need to do in our point in history. That's why it's so important to teach our kids history because we're giving them living, breathing examples of, of what we need to do and what we need to be in, in our time in history. Absolutely. It does. And another thing it gives you a lot of perspective. Um, I uh, I do a blog five days a week, a blog post five days a week called Daily Encouragement for Homeschooling Mothers. Notgrass.com slash daily. It's we will link to that in the notes, everybody. We'll, we'll have links in there to all of this. But my post for today is about um, I, how tired I am of uh, people attacking other people politically. Mm -hmm. It just has broken my heart that even when we all ought to be together and on the pa same page right now where we all work together for a solution, there's still mm -hmm. this uh -huh. going on. But history will tell you that it's not new. I mean, right. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, their campaign, it, it was, I, uh, it was terrible. And they had been close friends before that. Right. But another thing you learn from history is they reconciled and they wrote letters back and forth to one another for years and years and years. That is beautiful. One of their friends made that happen. He worked as a peacemaker and made that happen. And then amazingly, the day that John Adams died, which believe it or not was the 4th of July, mm -hmm. his last words were Thomas Jefferson survives. Little did he know that Jefferson himself had died the same day a few hours before at Monticello. But the last person on his mind when he died was his friend Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. But if if that campaign was going on now, oh, the media oh. would have had a heyday with absolutely it. And, and and maybe have kept it alive and maybe they would have never reconciled you know so right uh, but my point of this is that history will teach you the truth of what god says that we're all sinners there isn't a perfect historical figure you you will find when you do when you study history that Yes, George Washington had slaves, and that was awful. Right. But over his lifetime, his attitude about slavery changed. It didn't change as fast as we wish it would, but it did change over time. And we can change over time. But right. that doesn't mean he's not a hero. If we wait for perfect people to have as heroes, we've only had one. His name was one. <laughs> right. And everybody else 
is a flawed hero. And that is something right. our world desperately needs to know. Absolutely. The politician that gets lambasted it is another thing I said in this post today is he has a mom and a daddy and a, you know, a spouse maybe and children. And when you treat people this way, you hurt all of them too. Totally. And, uh, but, but there aren't any perfect people anymore. Just right. Jesus. And we're all sinners and we need him. And that is something you learn from history that mm -hmm. you, you can't worry if your hero, if you find out something bad about your hero, you're just finding out he's human. Right. And, and I think that that's so good because in so many schools, they're pulling out parts of history because they think it's offensive or there's there's parts of it that are going to shine someone. And it's like, that's real life. Like, there's a lot of parts of history that are offensive. You know, uh, the Holocaust was very offensive and, and it, it should be and we should be offended by it. Right. But like you said, again, as believers, that points us back. I love how you said that. It points us back to the truth that there are no perfect people and only Christ. And so our hope isn't in our heroes. We learn a lot from our heroes. We grow a lot from our heroes, but our hope is only in Christ. Um, I, I am so excited. You you light a fire in people. I can feel it in myself of, of history and learning history and the importance of history. But also you bring a, a peace and an encouragement to moms that have struggling learners, because that can be overwhelming at, at times. And so, so you've lit a fire for history, but you've also brought a calm to moms to say, you know, you might think that you have a struggling learner, but, but the reality is, is we're all struggling in certain areas. And so mamas find your kids passion that, that doesn't mean throw out the things they're struggling with, work on those things with them. But, but find what works for your child. Stop trying to fit them in a box because that will exhaust you. You will quit. It will, it will make you run if every day you're trying to fit your child into a box that someone else has made. But rather, get to know your child. Learn your child. Don't be discouraged that they're struggling. We all struggle. We all struggle in our own ways. So be encouraged, mom. Um, and for goodness sake, go get some great history books. Um, Charlene, tell us about Not Grass History. Tell us a little bit about what you do and what Not Grass History is and, and how we can get our hands on, on what you have done with that. Well, um, Not Grass History is the 21 years old on the 1st of July. We've been writing history for a long time and we're working toward a, a history curriculum for every year. We're uh, not quite there yet, but we have um, our Star Spangled Story, which is for first through fourth grade. It's an American history, like uh, our, this is how we do history. All of our history has literature to go with it. Not a mountain of literature, anywhere from eight to 12 books, depending on the age of the curriculum very tied in. So when, when you are reading, um, let's say in high school, you're studying pre-Civil War when you read Uncle Tom's Cabin. You're studying the colonial period when you're reading the Scarlet Letter. And uh, that goes all the way down to first through fourth grade. But of course, it's not the Scarlet Letter. Letter in Uncle Tom's right. Cabin in the younger ones. So we, um, we have world history, we have American history, we have government, economics, civics. If you go to our oh. website, notgrass.com, then you can find all of that there. And if you have questions, you're welcome to go to our website and uh, go to the contact us uh, place there and send us any question at all. It can be a question for me. It'll be forwarded to me if it's for me or if it's about the curriculum or whatever, the right person will answer it. But I have a real passion about writing history too. I get, I am just so grateful that I get to get up every day and do what I love. Right now, what I'm doing when we get off and I've had some lunch, then uh, because it's uh, 20 to one here in Tennessee, um, I'll go back to I'm revising right now. Oh, I hate to use that word revising. Pardon me, I didn't mean to say revising. I am everybody just cringe. 
Trust me, every lesson ends in a Bible verse. We oh, give you that. ideas for creative writing, for family activities. For So if your child, even in our first through, uh, especially in our fifth through eighth grade, if you have a student who loves science and doesn't think much of history, then Not Guys History is for you because we bring in the wonders God has created. For example, mm. In America the Beautiful, we have a lesson, God Created Mammoth Cave. We do that lesson the same time you study the War of 1812 because we mined saltpeter in Mammoth Cave during the War of 1812 to make ammunition to fight the British. So uh, when we do uh, the American Revolution, we have a lesson called God Created Chesapeake Bay because Chesapeake Bay is where the war ended and it ended there because the American and French troops had trapped the British who were there on the uh, mm -hmm. near the shore of Chesapeake Bay and the French ships had come in and blocked them. And so the world's most powerful nation um, surrendered to these upstart Americans there. Geography has a huge role to play in history, but in that lesson, you learn about the eels that migrate into Chesapeake oh. Bay. You learn about the fish that is so abundant in Chesapeake Bay that helped save Washington streets at Valley Forge. So, so children that are going to roll their eyes at history normally are going to grab onto this and love it. I'm just thinking every little boy I wants know. to learn all of this. <laughs> right. I mean, I when I wrote this the first time 10 years ago, but I mean, I... I when you say eel to me, I think, <laughs> but I love the story how God made the eel. They migrate all the way to the Caribbean to lay their eggs. Wow. And then those little teeny wincy elvers float back to Chesapeake Bay. Oh, my goodness. Caribbean. I mean, you can see God's hands. I was so going to say evidence of God in all of it. But that lesson begins with Yorktown and Cornelius. Cornelius. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cornwallis, in Cornwallis. Uh, uh, surrendering, but then you go on and see what birds live there and what yeah. migrate there and learn about the shad and, and all of this in that lesson. Oh, and fun. every unit in From Adam to Us, which is our world history, and America the Beautiful, which is our American history for that age group, every week they have a God's Wonder lesson. So you don't just find out that they finally sailed around the Cape of Good Hope. You find out what happens at the Cape of Good Hope and what kind yeah. of weather they have there and, and all of that. So Oh, I love that. I love how it's all integrated. That is that is and the literature and Bible study and all of that all together. Oh, I, I absolutely love that. Well, I, I'm also dying for you to tell your daughter that that she needs to put out all of her plays that she's written. Because when you were describing that, I thought my homeschool group here in my town would eat that up. Now, so she, tell her we want we want those. It's um <clears throat> let me think what her website is. Okay. Christianmusicaltheater.com, I think. I don't go there often. And Anyway, but, Charlie, we, we can look that up and make sure yeah, that we have it yeah, on, and then we will yeah, post yeah. it for our viewers. Has, uh, free little skits that she does at our church on her website. Oh, very and, nice. And she works, she has worked with other groups from time to time to help them put on one. Because that's lives. such a powerful way for kids to learn history too. Oh, and it makes them want to research because they want to know for their, for their plays. Well, Charlie Notgrass, I do not. <laughs> yes, yeah, I mean. I, um, here, but I don't want to keep you. No. And I, I can say with confidence, I do not believe this is the last time that homeschool Idaho has seen you. We, you have okay. left us wanting more and more of these incredible historical stories. And we cannot thank you enough for, for the, the fire you've lit and the calm and the encouragement that you've also brought to parents. So thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. And just thank you for being used by God in the areas that he's gifted you to bless others. We, we cannot thank you enough. Thank you for being a pioneer and paving the road for all of us. Um, 
so that we can we can homeschool freely now and have the resources that you've given us. So um, everybody head mm-hmm. over to the links that we've put and find Not Grass History and, and Charlene's family and what they're doing um, and have a great day. Enjoy your lunch. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, thank you. I really enjoyed meeting you. It was wonderful. Thanks again. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.